very proud of your tie. Oh, <laughs> you create it. Oh, it's okay. So three of us. I'll take the ginger gun. Two, two sets of tickets for Christmas for plays in New York. <laughs> cool. Let's just see. We saw it. Gail. If then, Thank you, Gail. Good evening. Welcome to the regularly scheduled town council meeting of March 17, 2014. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, Tony, can you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, this evening we are starting with a presentation from the Board of Education uh, after our attendance. Dolores? Councillor Hammond? Here. Councillor Hurley? Here. Councillor Kotkin? Here. Uh, Councillor Manusos cannot be here tonight. Councillor Martino? Here. Councillor Rao? Here. Councillor Roberts? Here. Deputy Mayor Barry? Here. And Mayor Montaneri? Here. Thank, Thank you, you, Dolores. Superintendent, you have the floor. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> How's that? We got it. Good evening, everyone, and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, very nice to be uh, with you this evening. Um, I will be presenting uh, the board approved proposed budget for fiscal year 2014 2015. I'm going to start right off with the numbers. Uh, rather than burying it deep in the uh, presentation. One of the things I learned that uh, last year's presentation, although detailed, was quite lengthy. So I've tried to uh, cut it down a little bit and give you all of the specifics. Uh, and then obviously with the expectation that we will be meeting prior to the budget hearing and certainly be, uh, prior to May 15th to have further dialogue with regard to this budget. Our proposed uh, budget for the 2014-15 school year is $55,088,268 representing an increase of $1,990,209. This is a percentage increase of 3.75% over the current operating budget. The process of developing our budget uh, was one uh, that was long, rather tedious at times. We had multiple budget workshops uh, over at the Stillman Building, both on Saturdays as well as on a Tuesday. I express uh, great appreciation to uh, the counselors as well as the mayor um, who came to uh, these particular workshops. Our initiatives with regard to this budget, you've seen them before. Um, we're looking at uh, the addition of a director of security and residency. We're looking for an instructional supervisor for math. And we're also looking for academic leader stipends, both at Weathersfield High School and Silas Dean Middle School. Again, I call these initiatives, but these are actually um, replenishing positions that we already had, with the exception, of course, of the director of security and residency. Other requests that were um, put forth by our administrative team but not included in the budget, you can see the list there, including library media specialists who are certified, elementary social workers, uh, security personnel, intramural activities at Silas Dean, and a painter in the uh, custodial department. Where we're at right now, we're at an exciting time right now in Weathersfield. With the Common Core State Standards, I'm sure you've all heard, Common Core State Standards, Smarter Balanced Assessment, Teacher Evaluation. Uh, education reform is in full swing and uh, for the Weathersfield Public Schools it's kept us very busy. Um, we are certainly focused on the Common Core State Standards and I will say that I'm very proud of the efforts that our district has put forward in terms of implementing these Common Core State Standards. Smarter Balanced Assessment, uh, 
we were due to begin the Smarter Balanced Assessment uh, tomorrow morning, both at uh, Weathersfield High School as well as at Silas D. Middle School. And uh, much to our surprise, the uh, test was postponed uh, by the uh, actual state, actually the federal government for that matter. So the Smarter Balanced Assessment has been pushed out a, uh, a one week. But interestingly enough, with our technology and what uh, we have in place, we feel that we're ready to uh, implement this test and we're ready to go. Certainly our 21st century schools and technology, uh, that, that is a very uh, important uh, focal point for the district. Professional development and instructional improvement is critical. Um, we continue to focus on the workshop model both for reading and writing, and that's kindergarten right on through grade eight. New and updated curriculum uh, at our next board meeting. We will be seeing a lot more new curriculum uh, that is coming forward for adoption by the Board of Education. Obviously, our high school renovation is a major component. Uh, educator quality, our new teacher evaluation instrument. Uh, it has been a uh, rather challenging start to the implementation of this new particular uh, program, but we think that uh, we're well on our way. And then finally, last but not least, we talk about the whole child and making sure that we're focusing in on the support services as well as the academics to make sure that we're getting to the whole child. In terms of our budget efficiencies, uh, we've done quite well with our contract negotiations. Again, uh, for the second year in a row, superintendent and assistant superintendent have taken a pay freeze. Uh, we have negotiated favorable contracts with nurses, custodians, and teachers. Uh, we have also uh, realized savings by the board shift to defined contribution pension. I also want to point out here, folks, with regard to the uh, uh, pursuit of grants. We were very fortunate this year to uh, have been awarded a WCRT grant for social services as well as a technology grant and a competitive school safety grant. We continue to look at shared services uh, in terms of natural gas, electricity, and diesel bids. We work uh, closely with Heather Vargas with regard to that. And we're also pursuing free uh, software options. For example, uh, over February vacation, we just rolled out uh, Gmail. So our server, which is old and uh, kind of decrepit and outlived its usefulness, is going by the wayside and we'll be utilizing Gmail from this point forward, which is a free service. Again, what does the increase include? Some of these are really non-negotiable, so we have our increases in negotiated uh, contracts. Uh, we have increases in our fixed costs. Don't forget the state and federal mandates. Our, our increase uh, calculated cost of the OPEB trust and pension. We did uh, double our contribution to OPEB trust this year. And again, we also focus in on our improvements in our budget initiatives. In terms of our salaries, I'm not gonna go line by line here. Uh, again, these, uh, this document is available up here at the podium and we will be posting it up on our website. Uh, but just if you look at some of the highlights here with regard to supervision, you'll notice a 7.57% increase uh, in supervision. Uh, that is largely due to the increase of the uh, math supervisor as well as the benefits. In terms of our benefits, retirement, uh, we have seen uh, some retirements. We expect to find some savings within the uh, retirement line. In addition to that, uh, we also have the issue of health insurance. Um, we were fortunate this year. Um, we were a little bit skeptical about being able to level fund this. You see a, a, an increase actually, 0.35%. The only increase in health insurance is actually for the benefit package for the uh, proposed math instructional supervisor. <coughs> And again, here's some justification. So that 53.73%, some of that is based upon the uh, increased uh, OPEB trust contribution. In addition to that, uh, unemployment insurance increase of 85.71%. Um, to get where we need to be, one of the things we are looking at is we are looking at the reduction of uh, 12 paraprofessional positions in the district. Uh, this is something that we certainly don't take lightly. But uh, we are looking ahead to the future, and we recognize that we have to increase uh, efficiencies in this area. So we're looking uh, to achieve this uh, primarily through uh, attrition. Our professional services, you'll notice here the 23.71%, that's for instructional program improvement. One of the things that I feel is really non-negotiable in this budget is the uh, provision of quality professional development for our teachers, for our administrators, for our paraprofessionals, even for our custodians and support staff. 
Um, we've been very committed to the uh, workshop model, and that uh, is going to certainly continue. We'll be entering year four with the workshop model. And again, with the uh, technical increases, the software as a service subscriptions, uh, our power school data management system is uh, one such example. Here's our proposed budget with regard to maintenance. Overall, an increase of 11.61 percent. Repairs and maintenance in building and equipment. Uh, again, most of our buildings, we're talking about late 60s, early 70s in terms of a build date. And we certainly have components that are wearing out. You'll also notice that Mr. Bushy has taken a, a decrease there in the maintenance supplies. Uh, that is uh, part of the process with regard to the high school renovation. Here's another couple of components here. There are some impacts with regard to the uh, Weathersfield High School renovation, certainly the rental and lease of building uh, for storage. We see a 15% increase there. And again, the heat energy change, that's been budgeted to take into account the fact that we will be melding in the new construction over at Weathersfield High School um, into the existing building. Our proposed transportation budget, we've seen this year uh, a, a rather large increase with regard to transportation of special education students in district. That's uh, indicative of the 22.09 percent increase. The other component there, the transportation supplies, that's our old friend uh, diesel fuel. Tuition and other services. It's so again, the tuition line, both for special education and magnet school students, um, has risen steadily over the past several years. I have a slide a little later on in the presentation that gives you an idea of the tuition costs with regard to our magnet schools, as well as the number of students enrolling in magnet schools. Again, the communication services are really based upon postal rate increases. Uh, what we've done in terms of our wireless, wireless telephone service, um, we've done an audit of each of the lines to see if there were areas in which we could uh, reduce the number of phones we have in district. So we'll be doing that over the course of the summer. Just to give you an idea in terms of the impact on tuition, you'll notice tuition is obviously the big, the big line there. Back in 2003, we had a total of 46 students attending magnet schools or charter schools. And this current year, we're up to 258. So you can see the, the uh, number of students growing over the course of time. And in terms of our magnet school tuition, this is what we've looked at over the past six years. Now, one of the ways we're able to offset this, I have increased the number of students uh, coming in on the Open Choice Grant. And because of the fact that we meet the 2% threshold, we get additional funds so that we're able to offset this. Uh, the Open Choice Grant also provides us the opportunity for uh, tutoring. So we will uh, hire tutors with that particular grant. But you'll see that the number is going up pretty steadily. Our student enrollment, you can see our student enrollment has uh, dipped a little bit but has been pretty stable over the past seven years. Um, we expect that that trend is going to continue. And our class size. Right now, our class sizes look pretty favorable. I'm projecting one area uh, the next year where we may have a bubble of 25 and 26 in a class. Other than that, that's it. We expect that we should be in pretty good shape with regard to class size. Taking a look at uh, supplies and materials, this is an area where we've shown some uh, pretty significant decrease. This was really done through the uh, budget development process. You'll notice software and media supplies and textbooks have taken a big hit. Uh, that was done during the budget workshop process. And again, with the conference and meeting supplies, you'll notice a, a rather uh, robust increase there of 84.45%. That's for uh, supplies for uh, professional development. And with capital outlay, you'll notice here with the capital outlay a uh, rather uh, significant decrease. 
One of the reasons that we're looking uh, at this decrease is because we're looking at the potential of leasing computer equipment as opposed to purchasing. Um, we feel that this will allow our budget to be more stable over the course of time uh, and will allow us on the backside to, uh, to, to pay some dividends with regard to getting equipment at a much uh, lower rate. And again, one of the things you'll notice there on the bottom of that particular slide, uh, replacement of custodial equipment and a new burner at Hanmer School. That was debated uh, quite a bit uh, during the budget workshops. And uh, Mr. Bushy had mentioned that this particular burner has really outlived its usefulness. And it was one of the things that the board had looked at um, to, to replenish in order to get this uh, particular job finished. And then finally, last but not least, looking at our budget outcomes. This is clear, and this is unwavering. We remain committed to providing a high-quality education for all our students, and I say all. We remain focused on continuous improvement while adhering to state and federal mandates that impact our budget. And we know we've talked long and loud about these particular mandates. They often come without funding, and we're left to fend for ourselves. We also know that families make residency decisions based upon the quality and reputation of a school system. I, for one, would like to say that I think that this school system has a very fine reputation in spite of what you may hear. And then don't forget, school district quality impacts property values. At this point in time, I'd entertain any questions that you may have. Questions from the council? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Mike. Quick, uh, you you noted a couple of things about the magnet the magnet school. At one point, uh, maybe you could take us through it a little bit. At one point, was that supposed to be a hundred percent reimbursed by the state? And then over time, have we not only do we have more kids, do we but are we responsible for a, an increasing share of the cost? of having that child go to a magnet school? Yeah, uh, Counselor Cocken, good question. One of the things with the magnet school is we pay a tuition up front for each individual student. In addition to that, if that student is attending a magnet school and is also eligible for special ed services, we would pay for the special ed services on an a la carte basis. Um, so yes, it has gone up. In addition to that, um, we also have the issue of preschool. And right now, at this point in time, for preschool tuition, we are not required to pay tuition for our preschool students attending magnet schools. That is always one of those, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, a couple years back, I got a bill for $96,000 for tuition. Ultimately, the state stepped in and picked up that particular tuition. So that's always a wild card that's out there. But we have, in fact, seen uh, increases in tuition for magnet school students, as well as the special ed services. How much do you think that the town and I average picks up for a student that goes to the magnet school? That's going to depend upon the particular magnet school. The tuitions, um, they do vary. Um, for example, the Greater Hartford Academy of Math and Science, we have some students that go for a full day and some that go for a half. Uh, we have students that go to um, the Goodwin College, uh, Connecticut River Academy. That's actually a project <laughs> learn risk, not correct. That's a learn uh, magnet school, and that would have a different tuition rate. So it does vary based upon the school. Okay. And one other area you had in the presentation you talked about um, the increase in heat energy because the high school is under renovation, and I assume some of that you had said was due to probably less eff efficiency at the high school, but some of it is because are you moving some programs out of the high school during the renovation so that, so is that, that other schools are going to be, uh, need to be heated at night when the programs move out of the high school? Or maybe you could just take us through what the, all the implications are. Certainly. Ha happy to do so. With regard to the evening programs, um, as you may know, the high school really operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We always have programs there. And with the construction project in place and in full swing at this point in time, all of our evening activities, with the exception of adult ed, are moved out. So all of our park and rec programs are moved out to other schools. Um, for example, our uh, Into the Woods, our drama uh, production, which is going on now, is being held over at Webb Elementary School. So we're finding a, a, it's a domino effect. So you know you may not have a lot going on at the high school, but every one of our other buildings is used consistently seven days a week. 
So that's definitely part of the factor. And again, the other thing that you're going to face is we move forward with the new construction, kind of tying into the existing building. Uh, they're going to be starting on masonry, so we're expecting that there'll be heat energy expended there. They may need to leave heat on in order to help paint cure or help the, uh, the, the varnish in the gym cure, so we have to be aware of that as well. Certainly the light energy as well, because quite frankly, we're going to be looking at double shifts. Okay. So. And last, at least last one for me, sure. the, um, and this has to do with, with Hanmer. Are you hoping to get the new burner in this summer b before the next school year, or is that some other time during the year? Well, at this point in time, uh, Mr. Bushy has done a remarkable job of, of limping it along and getting it through um, with, with consistent maintenance. If it would be something that we could get done in the summer prior to the heating system, it would certainly be most uh, conducive. We'd rather do it that way when it's not being used. Um, we certainly don't want to compromise the heating system uh, in, a, in a winter situation like we've had this year. Okay. And, and if it did, is, is the, I assume there'd be a huge increase in efficiency if you had the new burner in. Absolutely. Would, would, is that reflected in your budget, the increase in efficiency or not? No, it is not. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Other questions? Mike? I did. Uh, <clears throat> probably I'll follow up with Tim on one of them. It's just. That's fine. Uh, some of the numbers on the page I didn't understand, but on um, in the book that we received over the weekend, there was a page has a 17 on the side. It's in the first section called Introduction. It's Budget Appropriation History by Object. Yes. We have. I remember in the past we actually received the actuals by object, like over that time period. Is that in here? So I didn't. I flipped through it, but I didn't see it in here. If you take a look at the uh, section 704, there's the actual for the prior year as the uh, I saw the charter actual, asked. I saw the actual for the yep. prior year. This this one here has it trended over several years, the budget appropriation, but I didn't see. I thought in the past we had received actuals trended over several years. This is the one that we've usually given, but we could certainly go back and take a look at several years and give you the actuals. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Mike, a question about transportation, just, and I know this is more general, but we, we contract out for transportation services to a private provider of the Correct. buses. And is that, is that on a contract basis year to year, or is it a longer term? It's usually a five-year contract. It's a five-year. Yes, it is. And, and how do they provide documentation of the fuel cost to the school district? Well, in terms of the fuel costs, one of the things we're fortunate to be able to do, uh, Mayor, is to work with Heather Vargas. So we're able to um, project our fuel costs. And when we do the RFP, as we did with uh, Durham Transportation, who did win the uh, bid most recently, um, we will have them figure in the uh, diesel costs as well. And so it's based on miles and, and yes. usage. And it's, it's, it's yes. an, is it audited? I mean, just out of curiosity, is it independently reviewed to see if it's accurate? <laughs> Well, with regard to all of our RFPs, we reviewed each of those um, and took a look at um, a variety of different issues, Mayor. Um, we looked at uh, formulas for diesel. We looked at the age of the, um, the buses, you know, expecting if you've got an old fleet, guess what? It's not going to run as efficiently. They're going to, A, break down more frequently, and B, cost more in terms of fuel. We've also looked at it from a perspective of do the companies actually have the equipment that we need? vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a, uh, a lift bus. So when we went through the RFPs, we were pretty exhaustive in looking at all of those um, particular components. And do you know of any tendencies or trends where bus systems are going to look at alternative fuels like na uh, natural gas or alternative gas like, like some of the buses are doing, you know, in the, di in the municipalities? You know, we haven't seen that at this point in time. I mean, even from a perspective of our special ed transportation, you know, I'd like to see um, some hybrid technology come out for some of our vans. I mean, we have students that would ride just a simple, like a van, like a, a Dodge Caravan minivan. Right. And, you know, if we were able to see it like a natural gas vehicle or something like that, that'd be great. Um, from what we've seen from both of our providers, both Durham for our regular and some special ed, as well as access transportation for our special ed transportation, um, we have not seen a lot in the way of um, that type of uh, green engineering, if you will. Mm. And, and just the last question, um, I know there was some discussion over the last couple of years talking about the requirement to provide so many seats because of the district's numbers, for, irregardless of users and frequency. Do you know roughly the user percentage that's in play right now, ballpark? 
I'd, I'd have to get that. I'd certainly be happy to get that information for you, Mayor. It is an, it is an issue, head. though, right? It oh, it like absolutely is an issue. Absolutely. I mean, we still see buses coming into the high school, even with the renovation project well underway, that are half full. I mean, the convenient piece is to, you know, bring your child and drop your child off, and then you're on your way. Mm -hmm. And you watch them walk into the, to the school building. Um, but, you know, the reality here is we've got a lot of buses that are not um, filled to capacity at this point. Yeah, that's a concern. Thank you, Mike. Sure. Any other questions from the council? Um, I know this is a you know one step in, in a, a process that has been continuing and will continue I think over the next uh, 60 days or so as we move toward budget appropriation. Uh, I know we're going to be scheduling a, a couple of more follow-up meetings with uh, subcommittees as well as a joint meeting with the board. Um, I know having sat in and I know many memory members of the council have sat in on the board discussions through the finance and budget and then the full board as well and it, it's been helpful in watching the process get pared down a lot of good work has been done and I know we said that uh, I'm sure that we're going to continue to see it but I appreciate uh, the work that's been done by the board to date and uh, expect that we're going to continue some some helpful conversations over the next uh, couple of months thank you appreciate your presentation Mike We are going to move forward to public comment on two hearing items, the first of which is a public hearing on the application for a records management grant for the town clerk's office. Is there anybody wishing to speak on that topic um, before the council this evening? Records management grant. Seeing none, I will declare that one closed. A second public hearing this evening is on item 1B, which is a public hearing on amending the uh, other post-employment benefits trust document. Is there anybody wishing to speak on that open hearing item this evening to the council? Anyone wishing to speak on that item? Seeing none, I'll declare that hearing as well closed. Thank you. Uh, and then we'll move into general comments from the public. Anyone wishing to speak? Mr. Council, how are you? Good evening all, happy St. Patrick's Day. John Consul, 38 Ivy Lane. Uh, I want to read the letter to the editor that I wrote, uh, since many people, I'm sure some of them have read it, and maybe some have not. But it's titled, Consul Needs to Focus on Common Sense and Preserving Weathersfield's History. In a recent Hartford Current article dated March 6, 2014, page B6, GOP, GOP sells Deming, sell Deming Standers House. I need to ask the question I often ask while on council. What is the council thinking? The proposal to sell a donated historic property that is in the heart of the historic district is the same as selling a piece of town history that will never come back once gone. This will have a chilling effect on future donations as this evidence as this is evidence that certain town elected officials are not committed in honoring the donor's implicit intentions, whether explicitly stated or not, because it seems to me, the author, that the original donor would not want the sale to the general public, otherwise they would have sold it themselves rather than donate the piece of historic property to the town. In addition, a plan to subsidize the Historic Society with a direct subsidiary may work for this council, but how about future councils that may, in fact, find that the funds are needed in other places, hence leaving the society high and dry? Another factor is that whoever buys the property could, in fact, cause more of an issue with the historic district while running a business, and if the business shutters, which has been the case over the past 20 years with many different businesses there, what happens then to the property? Long-term consideration should be given to have the Historic Society become a self-funding entity. This should thoroughly be vetted by this council and also the new finance director and the finance committee. Historic buildings, if leased, should be leased on a more commercially reasonable terms, therefore alleviating the town's financial burden and resulting in prudent proposals for sale of historic properties. In addition, <clears throat> this property, along with many other properties, was vetted by previous councils over the past several years, and consensus was to take no action on any of these proposals of sales and put this to bed. Why it's coming up again, I, I have no idea, and I'm sure there's many other people in the audience that are going to question this. <clears throat> 
Council should have considered the grant for this property, which I think would have made a difference. We should consider any grant, and we should file for any grants that we think we can get, whether we get them or not, but every grant should be looked at and filed. And the more grants we have, the better it is for this town. Council should focus on certain priorities, one being the Wethersfield High School renovation, uh, and if they had to count some of the council members on this council, listen to me back in June, we probably wouldn't be in a case where we're $12 million over budget. And just to add to that, the chairman of the committee that's in charge of the building <clears throat> once sat up on this council and stated to fire, firefighters that were looking for a new boat and they didn't have enough money to go out and have a bake sale. So maybe this chairman should have a bake sale and see if she could raise $12 million instead of footing it to either the state of Connecticut tax dollars or to the townspeople where it's probably going to end up sooner or later. They should focus on street repairing. <clears throat> they should focus on the Board of Education's budget. And also they should really look at the letter written by, that was in the paper back on Tuesday, February 11, 2014, town grant list drops 5.6% where the town manager is comparing the town of Wethersfield, and I was highly insulted, to Waterbury, New London, and Ansonia, three of the worst financial areas in the state he's comparing our town to. He also goes on to say the grand list, the grand list and total town spending determine the tax rate. The tax rate will probably go up this year, but that doesn't necessarily translate into a taxpayer's increase. Well, I don't know how the tax rate could go up, without the taxpayers paying more money. We also see right now that the Board of Education is asking for at least you know, a 3% some odd percent increase. So how someone could say that to the taxpayers unless they think the taxpayers in this town have a fifth grade education is an insult. Finally, we should look at some of the costs because you talk about costs that, that run this building. Any old building needs costs. Any, and, and to have these type of buildings in town is going to cost us money. Look at the $250,000 spent on the Gulf Road property to buy easement rights. Look at the $60,000 plus spent on legal fees for the 20-year employees of the Wethersfield Police Department that took over 18 months and we came 360 degree full circle, almost gave them exactly what they wanted and this should have been settled without spending this kind of money. Look at some of the costs associated with some of the buildings that are going on in this town. You know, we don't, we're, we're, not, we're not in a situation where we're going to sell the uh, Millwoods Park and have that go, that, that costs money also. So I think the council, the council, and I'm not saying all the council members, but many of them really have to step back and really look at their finance, fi fiduciary responsibility to this town and what really needs, needs vetting and what really should be looked at. Thank you. Thank you, John. Other members of the public wishing to speak? Candace? <laughs> Good evening. I am Candace Holmes, President of the Governing Board of the Wethersfield Historical Society. I am here in response to the proposal raised at your last meeting of selling the Deming Standish House at 222 Main Street in the center of Old Wethersfield, currently operating as Lucky Loos. On behalf of the Wethersfield Historical Society, I would like to clarify some misconceptions concerning our excuse me, our interest in that building. In 1929, the building was offered to the town by the Standish heirs to preserve the rare setting and appearance of a most typical New England village. The Standish heirs agreed to bequest this property under the assumption that the architectural integrity would be protected in perpetuity by the town. The town was entrusted with keeping this jewel, which is literally and figuratively at the center of historic Old Weathersfield. In 1983, the Wethersfield Historical Society took on a major responsibility in agreeing to manage two vacant town buildings, the Deming Standish and the Wells Building, which is now the Keeney Cultural Center and Museum, to launch a huge private endowment drive, to increase staff and programs, and to commit the time and talent of its volunteers for the benefit of the entire community. This also constituted an enormous risk for the Historical Society, and there was considerable discussion and persuasion involved to obtain full membership acquiescence. Ultimately, we entered into this agreement with the town, and we have kept 
our end of the bargain, operating in good faith that the town would do so. The officers of the society who are ourselves members of the community hold our assets in trust for the community, such is the nature of a nonprofit. Our work, whether it is managing town property, mounting exhibits, hosting lectures or concerts like the free summer concerts on our lawn, all this is done for the benefit and enjoyment of every single member of this town. Mr. Manusos was quoted in the paper as saying that the interior of the Standish House has been entirely redone. That is not so. The building was pictured and described in Early Domestic Architecture of Connecticut by J. Frederick Kelly. Its exterior detailing is refined and its interior composition is formal, <coughs> perfectly balanced, and all of the detail and scale of the moldings is also extremely fine. There remain seven of eight walls of original paneling created by James Francis, a Weathersfield native and master carpenter. Captain Francis is also credited with woodworking artistry in the old academy, our offices, and an estimated 50 other homes in Weathersfield. Mr. Manusos was also quoted as saying the structure was basically a commercial building. The word commercial does not conjure up a 227-year-old building, which is the finest example in Weathersfield of the evolution of architectural styles from colonial Georgian to federal. Nor does it do justice to a building that was included in the Library of Congress Historic American Buildings Survey. In fact, this commercial building sits at the center of our historic district, just rated one of the top 25 New England must-see historic towns by the Hartford Current Buzzfeed. We manage four historic properties for the town, the Kinney Cultural Center and Museum, the Old Academy, the Cove Warehouse, centerpiece of our town seal, and the Deming Standish House. For those who feel that this arrangement benefits the historical society financially, you should know that in the past year we expended $80,000 at the Kini alone in the form of maintenance contracts, insurance, repairs, security, utilities, including a $3,000 rebate to the town in 2013 and a proposed $5,000 to the town this year, and our programs. We took in $41,000 from Lucky Lose in rental payment. The primary motivation behind the arrangement was never to be profit, but preservation, our mission. This arrangement has not only preserved the Deming Standish House, it has preserved and used in a practical, productive way two surplus town buildings and used them in a way that is acceptable to the neighborhood, revitalizes the center without destroying its character, and which keeps the Deming Standish House on the tax rolls, which taxes increase as the property appreciates in value. Our relationship with the town as keeper of their historic properties has served the town well for all these years. There is no reason to risk the future of the buildings or the viability of the historic district or to engender a chilling effect on possible future gifts. Thank you. Others wishing to speak? Gus? Good evening, Gas Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. An old saying of mine, a winner will never quit and a quitter will never win. I know I will never win right here, but that is going to push me not to quit. The police report dated May 21st, 2009 did not recommend a stop sign in the eastbound direction for Morrison Avenue. And I quote, the MUTCD reports stop signs cause an inconvenience and should be used only when warranted. Well, on numerous occasions, I have demonstrated to the town that a stop sign is needed for the intersection of Tifton Road. Why? The intersection site distance from Tifton Road and Morrison Avenue, as measured by the town again, was 232 feet to the west. This distance does not meet the minimum recommended distance for 25 miles per hour. That's the posted speed on Morrison Avenue. 280 feet is recommended. So as you can see, there is the warrant that the police is looking for. By the way, Hillcrest Avenue has less traffic and with two stop signs that are not warranted at all. <coughs> 
Let me compare again Hillcrest Avenue and Morrison Avenue. Again, Morrison Avenue pavement is 24 feet wide. Hillcrest Avenue is 30 feet wide. Morrison Avenue has a three foot wide strip, snow shelf, right? Hillcrest Avenue has an average grass strip of 15 feet, which makes pedestrian or traffic much safer. The distance from the curbing to the front of the houses is 35 feet from, for, for Morrison Avenue, 35 feet. For Hillcrest Avenue, the distance is 60 feet. And I, I tell you, the noise is when people or the ca cars go by. Being at 35 feet is much louder than at 60 feet. The town has taken measurements for the intersection side distance for Orchard at Hillcrest and found to be 344 feet to the east and 970 feet to the west, 344. Tifton is 232. Well above the recommended distance of 335 feet for 30 miles per hour. As you can see, there is no warrant for stop sign on Hillcrest Avenue, but they have two stop signs. We don't have, we have one. Let me remind you again that when Morrison Avenue neighborhood was developed back in the 1900s, it was envisioned to be a residential street with minimum traffic, and it was never meant to con connect to Silas Dean Highway. At that time, Morrison Avenue did not have any true traffic from Walker Hill Road to Silas Dean. It was not connected. As a result of past town decisions, Morrison Avenue now has an average daily traffic of 730 <coughs> cars a day. Hillcrest has 365. Why do you think that happens? I believe it's because of the stop sign. The most unsafe location on Morrison Avenue is between Orchard and Tifton. There are no handicap ramps on Tifton Road connecting to the north side of Morrison Avenue. The town does not want to encourage crossing in this area because it's unsafe. That's what I was told. But safe enough not to require a stop sign that doesn't make sense. The stop signs on Hillcrest Avenue and the lack of a stop sign on Morrison Avenue in the easterly direction is the reason why, again, is the average daily traffic for Morrison Avenue is twice as Hillcrest. By the way, the 2009 report by the police stated that the report is for the intersection of Orchard Street and Tifton Road. It also goes to great length to justify the stop sign for the westbound on Morrison Avenue, but never mention any intersectional side distance from Tifton. I wonder if they really knew what they were doing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gus. Mr. Standish. My type isn't quite so large, so I will use my glasses. I'm Lee Standish. I live at 278 Hartford Avenue in Wethersfield. I was appalled to read of the recent effort on the part of the Republican Council members to thwart a grant application for upkeep to the Standish House and their subsequent intent to sell the property to a private entity. My grandfather, Jared Butler Standish, undertook great effort to bring the Standish heirs into consensus over entrusting the family's property to the town, specifically so that it would be cared for in perpetuity. We did this with Standish Park as well at the same time. His language and documents I possess was that the property was offered to the town by the Standish heirs to preserve the rare setting and appearance of a most typical New England village. Given my grandfather Jared's role as Weathersfield historian, his re historical research, design of the town seal, which sits behind you, help in formation of the Historical Society, Village Improvement Association, and chairmanship of the Tercentennial Committee, the Standish Air's intent for historical preservation was quite clear. Unfortunately, and in hindsight, I wish this had not been the case, there was no deed restriction. We thought we could trust the town. But if the town chooses to treat such largesse and original intent with this level of disregard, I will do my best to publicize its breach of trust and win public support for opposition to this move. I would assume that the Historical Society leadership and membership 
will mobilize, as will anyone who values the quality of life and the historical inte integrity of the village. This architectural treasure, as described, rightly belongs to Weathersfield citizens as a gift and to posterity and to history. It falls, if it falls into private hands, you send a deep chill to anyone contemplating future gifts to this town. You lose control of an irreplaceable historical asset to the foibles of another's business plan. You harm the historical society's ability to continue its contributions to the town's well-being and you violate a trust I and many others will not soon forget. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, John Poriello, 49 Dudley Road. I also uh, am opposed to the proposal to sell the Standish House for uh, the following reasons. Um, number one, it, it is a breach of trust that the Standish family um, gave to the town and would be a poor signal to future donors that their wishes are only as good as the legal wording that they uh, attach to their gift and the cre create creativity of future council members to uh, get around uh, any um, loopholes that might be attached to deed restrictions. Financially, selling the property wouldn't benefit the town with today's low interest rate environment. The proceeds of the sale of the money invested in a guaranteed investment that would, that would, not, lose, that would not be at risk to lose principal wouldn't generate the current $41,000 that we just heard in uh, rent that's being generated to the historical society. And there's also a, a large risk that the building could fall into disrepair or the business could fail and the property be vacant like the, um, like the Masonic home, which would be a black eye on, uh, on the community. So for those reasons and others that have been mentioned by, by um, other speakers, I would um, ask that the council uh, reconsider this flawed proposal and, uh, and shelve it. Thank you. Tracy. Hi, I'm Tracy McDougall, 45 Knott Street. Um, and I'm here wearing my Board of Education hat. Um, and I think the word um, for our Board of Education budget this year is frugal. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you one quick story about um, how our Board of Education budget reflects my personal frugality. So I'm so frugal um, that I make my own Windex for my house. <laughs> um, and you can save a lot of money that way. And I think that um, that is a theme running through our Board of Education budget this year. Um, I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Um, we have, as you might imagine, quite a few copy machines in our system, and we are constantly renegotiating those copy contracts. Um, and one nifty um, component that we've added in is when staff go to make copies, they have to swipe in so we know exactly who's making how many copies. Um, and I can tell you that um, recently that's been um, carefully monitored and people who are making too many copies are, um, uh, they get a little discussion about how to reduce the amount of copies that they're making. Um, we have, over the past couple of years, um, worked with Kelly Services on trying to find some savings with our um, substitute teachers. Um, and it's really been um, of great benefit to us in other ways. Um, it's, it's been a great arrangement, so we found some savings there. Um, and as our superintendent mentioned, we've moved over from Outlook to Gmail, which everybody knows is free and a pretty good service. So we've got some savings there. Um, in the curriculum development area, um, we are using our um, teachers to develop curriculum, um, which saves us uh, quite a bit of money. Um, some districts would use out of uh, district uh, consultants uh, for that project. Um, and the last example that I'll give you is um, we are reducing the number of paras this year um, and encouraging, ho hopefully working with parents and students to encourage the students to um, work more independently and on their own. 
So, and the other thing that I'll point out to people um, that you probably have noticed, as, as I have been very appreciative of, is the amount of detail that we receive in the budgets over the last couple of years. Um, I was very pleased to see a couple of years ago um, each line item detailed with the percentage that it increased or decreased from the prior years. Um, and this year, we had a brand new feature, which was there was a little explanation about why it decreased or increased. And I personally found that very helpful as a Board of Education member um, to understand our budget and how we got to those numbers. So I'll just leave you with the word frugal. Thank you. Thank you, Trace. I noticed the uh, cleaning budget's up 5%, so maybe you should give Fred your, your uh, formula for Windex. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to switch in to speak? <clears throat> yes, sir. <clears throat> My name is Robert Cobb. I live at 99 Meadowview Drive. I um, just want to welcome the new gang to uh, uh, your position and uh, I hope that you'll uh, be uh, frugal with taxpayers' money. Uh, I never thought that I would uh, look at the left side of this so happily, but I, you know, I really appreciate your general opposition to the selling of the Stanish home. Uh, you know, I'm disappointed that anybody would think about, you know, selling it. Uh, I remember when we, there was discussion about the Goff Road property, and one of the people that was uh, for the, uh, you know, having the developer get the two hundred thousand dollars described that as majestic, you know. And you know, I'm thinking about this overgrown, crummy piece of property, you know. And if there was something majestic in, in our in our town, it's the Standish House, you know. And uh, I remember many years ago when I walked in there and I said, wow, look at this place, you know. I grew up in a section in New York and never saw anything like that, you know. And uh, not too long ago after the uh, current uh, tenant moved in, I went in there and I was stunned at how all this... Beautiful woodwork, mahogany and walnut. It was all painted black. I said, what the heck happened here, you know? What decorator, you know? Some goth person or something, something attacked the place, you know? But anyway, uh, uh, what would Ms. Manners say if we were to sell this thing? You know, I, I think the first word is like rude. I mean, it was a gift. And it should stay that way. It should be uh, preserved in perpetuity as a, as a, as a piece of property uh, owned by a town, not by any individuals. Um, if what happened to the inside of that should happen to the exterior, I mean, I mean, that would not be allowed, I guess. But uh, you know, suppose bankruptcy. You know, I mean, all of these things are possible. So I just think we should own it. Uh, so thank you for. You know, thinking that it's a good idea to hold on to it, and not to sell it. Uh, the other thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, real quick, the uh, the uh, budget. Uh, I'd like to remind the town council members that when you crunch the numbers, that over 80 percent of the board of ed budget is for compensation and benefits for the uh, board of ed employees less than 20 percent, less than 20 cents on the dollar goes for um, things like books and computers and desks <clears throat> and uh, maintenance. So when we look at a three plus percent percentage something increase, you know, uh, just because the stock market's going up, I can tell you that Connecticut's in bad shape. I go to a lot of people's homes in my business. I can tell you, people are hurting. Uh, I just uh, met with a bunch of Metropolitan Life people. They're pulling out of town, uh, you know, pulling up roots in, uh, in, in uh, Bloomfield. Very quiet, but it's happening. Magnificent facility. It's like a ghost town in there. 
Uh, I was at another business. They just p passed a 20% across the board pay cut. So, you know, we, we're really still in austere times here. And uh, um, I think a 3% uh, increase for an already um, inflated dollar amount for the budget is, is uh, not frugal. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Others from the public wishing to speak this evening to the council? Matt, how are you? Good evening, Matt D'Angelo, 16 Denison Ridge. Happy St. Patrick's Day, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, I will speak briefly in support of the budget. I know it's the beginning of the process. And I also know, obviously, that this council's got its work to do in balancing uh, the merits of this budget and weighing that against the needs of the other services in this town and the needs of the taxpayers. Uh, and I don't pretend that I'm speaking from an unbiased perspective, but I will say that based on my drawing on my own personal experience from having served on the board uh, some a few years ago with Councillor Roberts, if I recall quite fondly, that uh, that was an era where, for the most part, Budgets got passed on party line votes, and we saw increases of six, seven, eight percent. I remember a, a Republican board passed a four percent budget, and that was met on, again on a party line vote, vote, and it was met with some uh, uh, hand wringing and opposition from the other side. And again, that's the nature of the beast when you have party line votes. The minority party doesn't have a stake in the budget. Uh, the other thing that I recall was when I left the board. The outgoing superintendent, Dr. Proctor, said, told us that we needed to maintain annual increases of about 5.6% to maintain a current services baseline. That's 5.6% a year just to stay where we were. And I said, guys, over the long term, even over the short term, we got to find a way to bend that cost curve down. Uh, I think looking at the big picture, by and large, acknowledging that there's some bumps along the way, uh, the two parties did come together and work together to at least begin to bend that cur cost curve down. I know Tracy used the word frugal. I know other people would argue it's not as frugal as it should be. It's also not as generous as others, others would have liked it to be. But it is the product of the two sides working together to try to arrive at a consensus. They're doing, in fact, Mr. Mayor, the very thing you said you wanted to do on the council. Uh, you have five votes on your side, so you have the luxury of not having to do that. They've worked together because they really have no choice. They're, the, the parties on the board generally are not in lockstep on every issue, and that's probably a good thing. So uh, I would urge you to give some due consideration to this budget. Uh, and I would only tell you that if you don't want a party line vote, then don't vote along party lines. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> George? I don't want to have a knee jerk or something walking up here. <laughs> Good evening, George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. I usually think a little bit about what I'm going to say, but I didn't do too much thinking about it tonight. I would leave you with a couple of thoughts. Mr. Cobb mentioned 80% and 20%. These are statistics and numbers that anybody in business is probably familiar with. 80% of your problems are probably within 20% of the area of whatever you're dealing with. Having spent many years in industry as an industrial engineering manager, whose primary objective was to help companies save money by being creative, whatever. I would leave you with just a cup, one thought, two thoughts. One of them, Willie Sutton said, why are you going after banks and why are you going after any particular, you want to go after where the money is. But the, 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 the comment I want to make is concentrate on the important few. As you go through this budget, I don't know whether it's right, wrong, or otherwise at this moment, but concentrate on the important few. 
rank everything by value, concentrate on the 20%, and forget about the minutia. It's interesting, it's interesting that what, what I sense is we oftentimes concentrate on the trivial many, which is what you want to ignore. And as I listen to conversation and discussion, much of what I hear being talked about doesn't mean anything. I mean, in all due respects to Mr. Bush, he tried to get a new burner, and he probably should. But it falls among the trivial many. When you look at that in the, turn, in the light of the 53 or 55 or however many millions of dollars it is, it's peanuts. Should it be done? Sure, it should be done. But that should not be your claim to fame. Work on those important few and skip the trivial many. And my friends on the board would be happy to understand and hear that I can say what I have to say sometimes in less than five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, George. Other public comments for the council this evening? We, we got that. <laughs> Thank you, Candace. Other comments? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to. Uh, Mayor? Yes. Do you want me to read? You have something to read in the record. I'm sorry, Dolores. I forgot you did mention that. Go ahead. Uh, during the week, um, <coughs> Councillor Hurley received this from Andrew uh, Sanzaro, and I will paraphrase. Uh, he, he sent the letter concerning the uh, Standish House, owned by the historic district and rented out to a business. It's considered as a treasure by the town, rented by the Historic Society for use as a restaurant to help support their programs. He still sees it as a problem with the establishment, paying less rent than they should, running a business, and with the town subsidizing it, by paying for the major upkeep of the building. He was angry to see it still going on after both he and his then partner 26 years ago, Steve Kelly, complained about the lack of concern for other businesses. He feels it does not show Weathersfield to be business friendly, it is not an attraction. It should be sold, torn down, and perhaps used for something which would actually attract business, like craft shops and galleries. He uh, also thinks that the last two establishments left owing taxes. He does not think the town should allow taxpayer money to filter into maintenance and upkeep, let alone dreaming of a $500,000 grant for that place. He awaits responses, and his letter was dated March 13th. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, yes, I think uh, Dolores said that that was sent to me. I believe it was sent to the whole council. Oh, I'm sorry, the one I you forwarded it to me uh, yes. from Andy Sanzar. Yeah, that didn't go yeah. to the full council. Thanks, Mike, for that clarification. Mr. Mayor, I believe uh, Howard Willard sent the letter to be read into the record as well. I sent it, he sent it to the town manager and the manager responded. I, I forward that on to the council. He, he didn't say he's he he, he, I spoke with him today. He asked I'll check the email. But we'll, we'll correct it if it hasn't. If it isn't here tonight, we'll get it read into the record at our next meeting. Thank you. That it, Dolores? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to council reports. Council reports? Jeff? Uh, just quickly, the, uh, the library board, as, as mentioned before, is, is uh, conducting a search for a new library director. Um, and a number of app applicants have submitted applications for it. There will be a community forum a week from tomorrow, Tuesday, March 25th at 7 p.m. in the community room at the library. So if, uh, if residents have thoughts about the, uh, the selection, um, the library board will be there to, to listen. Thank you, Jeff. Tony? Uh, I've got a couple, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Capital Improvement Committee, uh, met since the last meeting and finalized the capital budget and that will be on the agenda tomorrow night for planning and zoning's uh, 824 referral to us. Uh, EDIC has met, uh, they're in the process of updating uh, the business directory and putting stuff on the uh, website. Uh, they're working on a June uh, breakfast meeting. Uh, the farmer's market came forward and talked about their objectives for the year. And one of the things they're looking at trying to do is maybe on the first Sunday of the month, have a farmer's market on a Sunday at some point during the day. So uh, that's in the works as well. Thank you, Tony. Donna? 
I had a couple um, attended the Housing Authority meeting um, last Monday. They continue to look at different opportunities um, to come forward in regards to seeking grants to help renovate the um, properties. They're very cognizant of the need to keep those buildings up. Um, and they continue to work hard in that area. And also attended the Conservation Commission meeting um, last Wednesday on the 12th and had a presentation from Jim Woodworth on prime farmland preservation, which was um, inform informative. Um, and the commission will be looking at that a little bit more closely um, to see any possible tie-ins and is continuing to work on their open space inventory, finalizing that. Um, there's a few things that they will be adding to that and looking to get it completely finalized shortly. Thanks very much, Donna. Uh, Go ahead, Steve. The redevelopment agency also uh, uh, met uh, last Tuesday, I believe, uh, Monday or Tuesday. Um, uh, had not met in, uh, in, in some time, I think about a year and a half. Uh, excited to be back uh, looking at uh, ways for the town uh, uh, and, uh, to assist uh, uh, redevelopment and, and, and really focus on ways that, that uh, we as a, as a town and a council can uh, uh, assist in, uh, in, 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 in redeveloping uh, underutilized property in the town. And I think uh, uh, we'll be moving forward uh, uh, identifying uh, areas where we can assist. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. No. Councilor comments? But he's quiet tonight. No, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. I have a couple comments. How's that? Go ahead, Mike. Okay. <laughs> First, I just want to thank everybody that came out to the St. Patrick's Day Parade. It was a good event. Um, we had Jeff Bridges and many of the council members came out. I know uh, Paul sent his regrets that he was going to have a hard time marching, so but I do appreciate it. Um, we had the Griffith Academy, our nice Wethersfield High School band was there. We had the fire department, police department, and the ambulance was down there, and there was a great turnout in Hartford and a great turnout for our town. Um, and then I'd just like to comment on the Standish House. Um, I know we're putting, so one of the things that came up at the last council meeting was that we were putting a $60,000 ramp in. Um, we're putting, we're looking at another $500,000 for other capital improvements. And I know it would probably be irresponsible not to look at how we're spending this money on a property. And I know most of the townspeople want us to look at how we're spending money. I believe what was said at the last uh, review was that we should look at the property, including selling the property, but we should do a review of the property to see how much money that we're putting into it. I know one of the gentlemen spoke about benefits to the town. We don't think that by selling it, we're gonna get a great benefit. Um, we would think if that was, if that did come up as an option, that then we wouldn't have to put so much money into it. That would be, have been the benefit. Um, I don't believe the place would ever be sold, but we should look at how much money, I mean, this is almost $600,000 into a house um, that the town has. We should look at, you know, what other ways we can do to maybe help the property. Um, that's about it. Thank you, Mike. Tony? Uh, just on a personal note, uh, besides being St. Patrick's Day, it's an important day for one of our other, other councilor members. Just want to say happy anniversary to Mike Roel and uh, the missus. Wow. Thank you. Congratulations, Mike. Why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> other comments? Jerry? Well, just let me say that uh, his wife's birthday was the last, a significant birthday was the last council meeting. So um, he's doing yeoman's work. I'm starting work to worry to about him. <laughs> <laughs> he could be the new single counselor shortly. <laughs> um, just uh, for the manager, I've gotten a lot of complaints, calls about potholes, which I'm sure you've gotten, but specifically the area between Maple and the first section of Fox Hill um, f from Maple down to basically. Um, the first stop sign there. There's actually craters, um, and they're multiplying, and it's starting to look like a moonscape. So, I, I'm not sure. Some of them look like they're around um, MDC, um, 
uh, manhole covers, so I don't know if there's something we can get them to do, but it's, it's a very treacherous driving there. And then also back lane in Newington, um, which I'm not sure. I know one side is Wethersfield and one side is Newington. I don't know what the story is with the street, but that has um, down near Glen Oaks quite a few craters. And in fact, there's um, a turn into Glen Oaks to, with speed bumps. And somebody told me today that those are Wethersfield speed bumps and they're too high and they should be lowered. So could you add that to your list of things to look at, please? Yes, but I don't think we own the speed bumps, but we will take care of the potholes. Okay, thank you. And, and the, we're using quite a bit of cold patch right now, right? And that's Right, and we're probably going to come back to the council and ask for a supplemental appropriation to handle the potholes. We uh, expended a vast majority of the contingency fund to cover the snow, so uh, the director of physical services and uh, the assistant director are working up a number on what pothole repair is going to take, so probably the next meeting we'll ask for a supplemental appropriation for that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just a couple of things about the high school. I wanted to congratulate... Um, you know, we don't always recognize some of the things our, our, the students do. Uh, obviously, the Jets team uh, won a national award. That's been, I know, the, at the board meetings it's talked about. I think there's been some press on that. But I think uh, they certainly deserve recognition for their hard work. But also both um, with the building process going on, you know, there's some teams that have been relocated. They've had to uh, play at different, different locations. They really have had no home games in both boys and girls basketball in particular made the state tournament. Um, I think they, they deserve uh, recognition, but also um, uh, appreciation for really dealing with um, uh, a change in, in what they're used to and, and, and really without, um, without complaint and, and really without fanfare from us. So I think they all should be congratulated. Thank you, Steve. Other, Jerry? Just, just one more thing. The band this year participated in the um, St. Patrick's Day Parade, which they haven't done for a while, and they had their new, new uniforms. They looked great. Um, they had a repertoire of Irish music and uh, a lot of positive comments from people along the way that heard them. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, two quick things from my end. Uh, the first is um, there's a report out today, uh, for those of you who may remember, uh, a four-year-ago graduate, Abigail Corning, who was one of our top basketball stars in the town of Wethersfield and took our, our team her senior year four years ago to the state championship game with, in a very good battle with uh, uh, Hillcrest, I think, and lost uh, in that game. But um, she went to Fordham, for those of you who may remember, which... Uh, the year before she went to Fordham, her senior year, uh, had not won a game. It was 0-21, uh, I think. And uh, many people who heard that Abigail was going to Fordham were like, why would you go to Fordham? You're this great player. Well, uh, this past weekend, she was named the most valuable player in the championship game of the Atlantic 10. Fordham won the championship and finished the year 23-2. and um, And the coach uh, at the... Uh, post-game press conference uh, identified at Abigail as the single largest reason that Fordham turned around in the last four years. So they are going to the NCAAs for the first time uh, in 46 years. And uh, for those of you who remember Abigail, and I, I'm w among them because a couple of my daughters were in school at the time, um, you know, kudos to her and her family and uh, what an accomplishment. And uh, I'd recommend those of you who were semi-paying attention to go online and read the story about her. It's an excellent story and uh, just a great champion. Uh, a, a young lady with a lot of heart and uh, an incredible academic performance too, by the way. Um, secondly and lastly, um, I had the second uh, of five uh, coffees uh, this past week with residents in town that I've, I've invited uh, residents to come out to various locations. The first was at a Dunkin' Donuts a few weeks ago. Um, this past Friday was over at uh, Aroma Bistro in the uh, historic district. and. Um, I want to thank uh, Councilor Rell and Manusis for attending and uh, Councilor Tony Martino for taking copious notes for me during the course of uh, over two hours of discussion with residents at the Aroma Cafe. We had uh, quite a few residents came again. Uh, I'm pleased to say both between the first and the second um, uh, coffees, we've had almost 20 residents come down and meet with us for several hours. Uh, all age groups, all, all issues, um, many of them are saying they appreciate the setting as opposed to coming out to the public and getting in front of the microphone and the TVs and the lights and, and prefer coming down and having a coffee in a more intimate location. Uh, and so um, 
you know, I'm pleased with the turnout. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that other counselors are attending, of course. Uh, but the feedback that we're getting is very helpful and, um, I, I frankly, complementary to the feedback we get from our residents as we look at our priorities, um, feedback about how the town is doing, appropriate criticisms and concerns, um, and just the genuine sincerity of the residents that are coming down uh, to talk with us. So I, I'm appreciative that, that so far it appears to be going very well. The next one will be uh, next Thursday at, I think, at Panera, and they're posted on the town website for anybody wishing to follow up on any of the remaining three that are scheduled. So thank you to those that have come out and to the uh, counselors. And uh, Mr. Manousas just came in. I, wanted, I mentioned that you came on Friday. appreciate that, and Stathy. So town manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I did find that email from Buzz Willard, so bear with me. I'll, I'll read that into the record. Uh, dear friends, as a past president and still active member of the Weathersfield Historical Society, I was greatly surprised to read that the council is considering a possible sale of the Standish House, a.k.a. Lucky Lou's. We were quite pleased when a previous council made the decision to have a fine restaurant in the village center. Because the location is in the very heart of the historic district, that council decided to lease the Standish House to the Weathersfield Historical Society so they would have the responsibility of finding tenants who would provide an atmosphere complementary to our historic town. It is my understanding that the request for funding was not initiated by the Historical Society. As most of you know, as the official keeper of the Weathersfield history, the Weathersfield Historical Society has over 150 volunteers who give freely of their time to promote the town of Weathersfield, her history, and her business community to those beyond our borders. These volunteers are led by a group of professional historians. We promote staff care for and preserve our historic structures in the town. We also provide a library and family research center in the old academy and a permanent museum exhibit on the Weathersfield history along with changing exhibits at the Keeney Center. We need the rental income from the Standish House to help fund the Keeney Center along with the many other programs we provide for the edification and promotion of our wonderful community. A vote to sell the Standish House to private ownership would be a severe detriment to our town, the birthplace of the Connecticut colony. Many years ago when the Standish family gave this historic structure to the town, it was because they trusted the town to preserve it as a valuable asset for the community, not to be sold to a private owner. Let's not let them down, Buzz. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Kathy Bagley, talk about fireworks. Good evening. I'm here to talk about the fireworks in town. The Weathersfield Chamber of Commerce, as you know, has been fundraising to, um, to actually fund the fireworks display. And just last week, they notified us that they were getting close to their goal and they were prepared to move forward with the fireworks. So that was really uh, good news. And we had a brief meeting last week with a member of the chamber and a couple of the fire marshal and a member of my staff to talk about some details and start to get ready to think about the fireworks show. The date they're looking at is May 31st with a rain date of June 7th. So it's the, it's a, May 31st is a Saturday night and June 7th is the following Saturday night. So that's the, uh, that's the rain date. We always hope we get it in the first go round. So that's our plan. And um, we met with them preliminarily just to talk through things. And now we're here tonight just to give the council an overview before um, and to get your um, approval to move forward before um, we make any further plans. We have done some preliminary work just because you need different types of permits to do a fireworks show. And because of our location, we kind of hit them all. We have to talk with the Coast Guard because of the Connecticut River and the Cove. And we have to talk with the State Department of Energy and Environmental um, Protection just because of um, any disturbance we might do to wildlife in the area or any other concerns that they might have. And, um, and then the fire marshal works with uh, Brainerd Airport uh, to be, make them aware of what's going on and to go through that too. So we've done some preliminary work with all of that. And all of those um, organizations have said that we're, we can be a go if we're ready to move forward. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, our planning to date. And um, we're looking at um, the chamber will um, pay for the entire fireworks display itself. And we're looking to see if the town, through 
the department's operating budgets for those departments that would be involved in it would also help with the logistics of the event. So that's currently where we are with our planning to date. Questions for Kathy? Uh, Kath, what, what's the budget for our side of it roughly? We're, we're estimating roughly 15,000 as a, as a number. We used our, um, we looked at our budget from when we did the fireworks in 2009, kind of looked at those hours and used um, very roughly today's numbers. No other questions? I have just one. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, would there be any insecticide? Um, I know I think it was in 2009 I'd heard from some residents in the Cove area and actually those who went to the, uh, the fireworks, the mosquitoes down there, um, those living in that area know it all too well. Um, would the $15,000 cover any of the mosquito treatment if we were going to do anything like that? That is in the budget. Okay. Yes. We all know the mosquitoes down there. <laughs> If you remember the parade, we do it about the same time. Okay. And the mosquitoes, uh, depending on weather, um, do come out at that time of year. Definitely. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it was thought of and included in that fifteen thousand dollars. Great. Thank yes. you. Okay. Very good. One other thing, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Thank you, Kevin. Um, just want to add something to the end of the agenda. We want to introduce uh, a resolution to support two CROG grants. Um, and that's on the podium this evening, one for uh, Regional Data um, Recovery Center and one for Human Resources Data Center as well. Um, those would be CROG grants uh, and the resolution support for those. Are we, are we need a motion, correct? No, it would just be for introduction. For introduction. Yeah. Okay. We don't have to amend the agenda then. No. Thank you, Jeff. Dolores, any uh, communications? Uh, I have two things. One is um, there is an American Warrior uh, Connecticut Day of Honor a project. It's going to be April 26th. And what it does is it allows um, our veterans to go to D Washington, D.C. to see the various uh, uh, see the various uh, memorials that have been set up that a lot of them don't have that opportunity to go to. They, the, it's free for the veterans. They have uh, chaperones, and if a mem family member wants to go and chaperone, there's a $300 ch uh, charge for, the, for each chaperone, and every chaperone pays their own way. Um, but it is, they fly out of Bradley in the morning, and they come back that same night. Um, so if anybody's interested, we have forms for, for the uh, veterans to fill out, and we have forms for uh, a guard, people who want to be guardians. Um, the town clerks have been in, involved with this for the number of years that it has been in operation. Um, so if we have, want any other information, we do have it, um, and I'll have some of it go to the website. Uh, the other thing is on Thursday night, there is a um, charter revision committee meeting right in this uh, uh, chamber at 630. Thank you, Dolores. Okay, moving on to uh, B1. I do not believe we have any appointments or res resignations uh, this week. Uh, we have no unfinished business, so we'll move to B3A, a resolution authorizing the application for a records management grant for the town clerk's office. Do I have a motion? Move to approve the grant. Second. Thank you. Jeff? I'd ask Dolores to give you the info on that one. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, been able to apply for grants. This year the grant will be $7,500. Uh, my office deals with records management and um, all the land records that we keep in our vault date back quite a ways and we have uh, a lot of costs to keep them up. Um, so we collect uh, the uh, town itself collects a dollar for every document we record and two dollars more goes to the state of Connecticut the public library and by applying for their grants for historic documentation uh, we can do several things with it um, it's a way of getting it back the money that we collect 
for the work we do for them back to our towns and our communities. So this year it'll be $7,500. Um, we, I have traditionally used it entirely for town-wide events, not just for something for my department. We did the records room downstairs, uh, that's a secured room, and we have done a lot of work in the Sally Port and all of the land use um, <coughs> departments upstairs on the second floor, engineering, building, and uh, planning all have documentations and all of their new filing system was through the grants that we received. So this, we, whenever they offer competitive grants, we do apply for them, but for the last several years, we have not. So we're back to getting, last year was 6,500, this year we get 7,500. But that's what we use it for. Thank you, Dolores. I appreciate the work on that as well. Any questions for Dolores on this? I suspect probably not. Um, we have a motion and a second on uh, this grant submission. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you again, Dolores. Uh, moving on to 3B3B, amending the uh, post-employment benefits trust documents to clarify the appointment process of trustees. Do I have a motion? Um, I'll make a motion to amend the, uh, the OPEB trust documents to clarify the appointment process for trustees. I have a second? Second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, when we adopted the OPEB Trust last year, we made provisions for two uh, non-public official town residents to participate as trustees, but we did not clarify how they were appointed or their terms of office. This document in Section 14 clarifies that and provides terms of offices and methods of employment or uh, methods of appointment. So we would recommend you uh, adopt that. Thank you. Jeff, you had a... a yeah, I, I think that when we adopted it, um, we, we did allow for uh, certain members of the council, in, including the mayor, or certain member, representatives on the Board of Ed, um, as well as town staff, but we also put uh, something in it allowing for the uh, appointment of two folks with, uh, two residents with backgrounds in professional money management, which Generally speaking, the the member the other members of the council um, or of the committee don't have. Um, this is really just cleaning it up. I think it was, a, it was the right thing to do, but unfortunately didn't say how those two people would be appointed or for over what terms they would be appointed. So this really cleans up something that the previous council uh, put forth. And, uh, you know, we do have, uh, on a bipartisan basis, we, we put together, I think, a wonder, a very good plan to fund what a, a very significant unfunded liability of the town um, over the next 10, 15 years, um, which uh, hopefully as we go through the budget process we'll adhere to. But this, this allows some um, professional money uh, managers to oversee the process and also uh, really look over the shoulder, I think, of the folks that we employ in order to help us make investment decisions. So we're, we're, we're fortunate in Weathersfield to have a number of people who could qualify uh, because Hartford, the Hartford area is such a center for financial services, so this is really to take advantage of that. Thank you. Uh, questions, Donna? I just have a um, concern, not, not about the overall concept of doing this, but a concern about potential liability that could occur having um, mm -hmm. residents serve. I know, you know, looking at the elected officials and um, town staff, um, it, it's kind of a given that you're going to be serving in different types of committees in this in this format. But just concern about how you deal with potential liability, if there could be liability. And I'm not saying there would be, but just to plan out and talk about some of those type of um, perceived or per, um, things that could happen. And you know how would the commission or committee handle that? Um, well, or if there was I'm, a conflict of interest? Well, if there's, if there's a conflict of interest, just like there is if there's one with the council, or if there's one, let's take the insurance committee. We've got people on the insurance committee who work in the insurance industry. If somebody works at Travelers, we have somebody who owns his own insurance agency. Uh, we've got somebody who I think has just stepped down as chairman who is uh, an attorney who's represented various folks in the insurance industry. So clearly if there's a conflict, I think not only would they under our, our 
conflict of interest interest that um, ordinance have to step down but I suspect under their their employers conflict of interest perhaps even more important they would have to recuse themselves so I would imagine that if the if any if anybody came into this well I'm sure if anybody came into this position you, they're pretty much pre, uh, precluding from voting on anything that in any way would affect their employer uh, in terms of liability um, you know, board, uh, planning zoning commission members, zoning board of appeal members, um, inland wetlands members, uh, they're not elected, they don't work for the town, and I would assume that they, these folks would have similar uh, protection under, uh, from, I guess, malfeasance or whatever. But uh, there, there are two of them out of, a, out of a group of seven. I think we're just taking advantage of some of the expertise that resides in this town. Yeah, and I just wanted to raise my potential concern thank you other points concerns questions yes Do you have any other language? Um, um, yeah I mean I have a I have a concern uh, about it last year when I was chair of budget and finance this was something that um, we did consider but we had decided not to act on not just because of the conflict but because anybody that would have that experience would potentially be uh, you know a bidder for that that work and um, whoever's doing the job the, to the liability question that Mayor Hemmen was talking about if if the the uh, the company that we work with who is the investment advisor uh, advises on some investments this isn't like the insurance company or the insurance Commission exactly because I think these people don't they have a vote as to where the investments are going to be placed the committee has like the FAI, FAI would rec make a recommendation, just like the insurance committee makes a recommendation in terms of who, who the who the agent of record is and so forwards it to us. Right. So this trustee though would actually have a direct responsibility and, and a vote in determining which investments are made uh, for this pension fund. Uh, uh, the OPEB trust. trust. Yeah. Right. They would. So to the liability question, if if uh, if the investment advi if the investment advisor makes a, a recommendation and the trustees opt not to take that recommendation because of two arguably experts from the public um, w and it ends up being a, a poor decision, you know we can't go after the investment advisor for faulty advice because we had people that arguably are are supposed to be experts, right? I'm not following you. So an investment and the, there's seven members of the committee, correct? Right. So you're, you're uh, disqualifying you're somebody. None of the other ones have, have experience except for the two that are going to be the residents that are appointed. I mean, the, they, there's, I, five, I there's, the se there's seven is, votes, isn't correct? Isn't that why we're hiring you know, a professional investment advisor to, to make that, that, that re recommendation and suggestion for us? Well, the question is whether you want to use the experience that we have. You're, you're, you're disqualifying somebody from serving on a trust because they have expertise in a field. I'm not sure that that's how we should go about appointing people. If you know too much, you can't serve. Well, I, I don't know. I'm raising it because I just think it's potential liability, and I'd certainly like the, fin the new finance director to weigh in on it because um, my conversation with him didn't seem like he thought it was necessarily a great idea. Well, we passed this last year specifically wanting these two people on it and we've now wasted a year trying to get two people on here and now you're backtracking and because there happens to be a new finance director you've gone to talk to that person the council's intention was clear that we wanted two citizens in town on here and it seems to me like there's been a lot of stonewalling to make sure that doesn't happen and personally I'm happy that we're finally getting to the point where the council's will is being implemented I'm going to vote for it I'm sorry? Then vote for it. I will. Okay. And you can vote against it. That's all I have. Further comments? Any other points, questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second in front of us with respect to this motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Abstentions? Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, we are moving on to B3C, amendment to the administrative group salary schedule. Sorry, I wasn't in the mic there on that. Motion to approve the changes to the personal classification and pay grades for the administrative group. 
Second. Thank you. Uh, Mr. John Manager. Hey, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, the administrative group is made up of uh, department heads and non-union support staff, of which there's one, uh, full-time anyway. Um, and over the years, they've adopted a pay scale for those positions. And with the combination of departments that's going on, the scale doesn't necessarily fit any longer, particularly if you merge two directorships as we propose to do. So the uh, change that's outlined in red would allow the council on a case-by-case -case basis to authorize a salary exceeding the maximum for a particular job if we are combining those with other functions in the administrative group. And that's the proposed change in the salary and classification schedule. Questions about this from the council? Jeff, thank you for the work that you did on this. Um, it doesn't look like there are any questions on it, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you for your work on that, Jeff. Thank you. Um, we are. It's Excuse me, Mayor. Who, was, who did, made the motion? I think yeah. Jerry made the motion and Steve seconded. Tony made it. Oh, I'm sorry. Tony made the motion. Steve Barry. Nice. Is that uh, Dolores? Yes. Thank you. Uh, B3D, motion to um, salary increase for the merged position. Have a motion. Move to approve the salary of $128,767 for the Director of Recreation and Parks and Social Work and Youth Services, effective March 15, 2014. Second. Thank you. Jeff, again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Ab having amended the classification schedule to allow for this staff is recommending the merged position of director of social and youth and recreation and parks for Kathy Bagley with a commensurate salary of $128,767 per year effective March 15, 2004. The position will be a combined position primarily for programmatic uh, co collaboration amongst the departments. They both have staff at the uh, town hall they both provide services to youth they both provide services to senior citizens so the programmatic overlap is there and with Kathy directing both sides of that house it's going to become much more efficient the plan is to hire an assistant director of social youth services which has been vacant for some time and that assistant director would have a primarily primary focus on social work which would handle that side of the department's uh, process along with the other staff members. So, thank you. Questions? Thoughts, concerns? Kathy, I know you're sitting in the back. Uh, you know, I'm sure all of us uh, would, would agree that your, your willingness to step up and assume these additional responsibilities, not only is it economically efficient for the town, but given your many years of service and familiarity with youth services, it's, it's greatly appreciated. Um, and it, a, a nice uh, piece of management work by our, our town manager to work with you on that. And I uh, actually thought that you uh, negotiated a very reasonable increase in your salary given the amount of responsibility. So thank you for that. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the table with respect to this salary adjustment. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you again, Kathy. Thank Kathy. you. And finally, three, B3E. Uh, regarding a federal grant for the Cove Dock. Do I have a motion? A uh, motion to accept a grant in the amount of $494,649 from the State of Connecticut uh, Department of Energy and, and Environmental Protection, uh, BOR Boating Division, to design, construct, install, and maintain uh, floating docks, moorings, and navigational aids. Um, et cetera, at Cove Park uh, Transient Vessel Marina in the town of Wethersfield upon the terms and conditions set forth in the personal services agreement. Second. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? Uh, I would ask Kathy to, to kind of speak to this this evening. We have a grant opportunity that we, she's been working on for some time, and her perseverance is unmatched. <laughs> I'm getting closer. <laughs> Um, this grant, I've been board, uh, before you on this um, over several years where we applied for the grant and had got it accepted. 
and have been working with the state and the federal government on the contract for the grant. And now we have the personal agreement between the state and the town for the actual um, acceptance of the grant. It's the 494,000 will help to pay for the improvements to Weathersfield Cove for the boating traffic. It, uh, the major part of it that you'll see is the um, replacement of the docks. As we've talked about before, the docks will be replaced and um, there'll actually be a floating dock that will float with the tide and with the high water and they will stay in year round. The grant also covers some navigational aids in the cove and also some additional moorings out in the cove. So that's the, that's the grant behind it. As part of the town's process, we, um, we submitted um, in-kind services to help towards the local match and also had to put up some additional funds towards that. And that is in the grant um, in your uh, packet. I just have to refer to it because the numbers get me crazy sometimes. It's uh, our local match for the 494,000 is $176,007, and that was both in kind and uh, cash match. And then the grant funds uh, are partially prorated based on how the federal government looks at the grant. We had known that from day one, and we've been saving money to be able to put money towards the project to complete it. So that's both from the uh, Cove Preservation Fund which is made up of funds from the boating fees. And also over the past uh, two years, we've been putting aside money in the capital improvement program of $25,000 each. And the request for the proposal for budget year 14-15 in capital improvements is an additional 50,000. That all together will give us the money we need to do the project down at the Cove. Did that really quickly, I hope that. The remaining funds are in next year's CIP, so I'm this will have to, you'll approve it tonight, but it'll be on hold okay. awaiting the adoption of the budget. Kathy, what's the time frame to get the project done once we get initiated, obviously, with the funding? Um, our goal would be uh, potentially the fall of this year or the spring or, or next year, 2015. Uh, possibly the spring if the water's not too high or then we might have to look at the fall again of 2015. So it's, it's possible it, would, it could be done before the end of this season, but it would be the very end of the season? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it depends. We still have to do the final design and bid specifications for the project, and we can't award a contract to do that yet until this contract is signed, so you can't get ahead of the game. Right, right. And there, there was some delays with this, right? There was some stuff that slowed it down, right? Because I had some of the residents that came out actually last week asked about about the delay and what, what was that about? We've been um, negotiating with the uh, federal government and the state government about the contract and the, the way the funds um, uh, were, were going to be used in our in-kind service match. <coughs> Based on what we had submitted, they had some concerns whether or not all of that was eligible. So we've been working through that process. And, um, and just the contract itself with the state and federal government. And, and for this season, what, I know we, the docks that we have or we'll be having out, they're still usable, but you know, obviously problematic. Yes, it, it's, if you get that high water, then they're not usable. I got you. So that, that's why we, we started this project. And this was also recommended in the uh, Cove Master Plan. I remember. So that was 2000, so we're working on it. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, look, any questions for Kathy on this? Jeff? Oh, um, Kathy, uh, yeah, I certainly remember the initial presentation from, <laughs> from Charlie on this and as we were getting through it. Can you help me? The total cost of the project, I'm just looking at the spreadsheet that's attached to our mm -hmm. packet, and I see it's like a, about a million, a, bill, a million and a quarter. Is that, is that how? Uh, one, one million two hundred seventy-five thousand, and then I see prorated costs. Can you help me again, the difference between the total and the... The, um, the federal government and the state government prorates projects based on, this grant is uh, for transient boaters. So they look at it as they're only gonna fund the piece that is for transient boaters use only. 
So when you look at the docs and you look at some of the other things, the way the docs are set up, they're prorating the docs at, um, there are 10 slips on the docs. Three of them will be used by public safety or the harbor master. So that leaves seven docks, uh, seven slips on the docks that are available for transient boaters and other uses. And so they look at prorating seven out of 10. Oh, okay. And, and they carry that very complicated formula through how this whole budget is set up. And it would probably take me a class to explain it to you. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, when I see dredging, there's a dredging cost in there. Is that, is that different from the dredging that's going on now at the Cove, or is that, that 450000 that's listed for dredging part of this overall? It's part of that, and this grant was submitted before way before we knew anything about uh, the, the state money that we got for the grant, for the dredging, excuse me. Okay. So that'll be looked at as um, whether, that'll be something we'll be working with the state on as to how that will play out in the budget. Because okay. the dredging is funded through the Department of Transportation. Recently we got that grant, but this was submitted about two, or two years ago. Okay. And we didn't know at the time that we would get that money. So, okay, so is this likely a little bit, gonna change a little bit because of that, the, what we're looking at on the sheet, or? And, and I guess I, what I'm going toward is, that ultimately, in terms of taxpayer money beyond what's already been allocated, is there another, is there another allocation that we're gonna be making in a, in a future, whether it's next year or future year for this? Is that what you're, or are you pretty much covered either through fees or what we've added? already appropriated yes I, I don't believe it, as I look at it today that we would be coming back looking for additional funding um, partly we were able to use the um, the new state money that we received for the dredging of the channel as also to help with the match for what we what we had already done is in-kind services so um, this is the budget that is it has to be presented by the the federal government and the state government okay so you're sort of i mean this is good leveraging i think what you're doing very much so that was that was also a help that that came through okay thank you and you do know that that work is is going on down there now that they are dredging which is pretty exciting to have that happen good okay. thank you thank you jeff tony uh mr mayor just for uh, housekeeping, uh, looking at Kathy's action required, I think we have to amend the motion to add to it uh, that uh, Jeb Bridges is duly authorized to enter into and sign contracts on behalf of the town of Wethersfield. The town manager is further authorized to provide such additional information and execute such other documents as may be required by the local, state, and federal government in connection with said contract and to execute any amendments recessions and revisions there too. Thank you, Tony. Can I get a second to that amendment? Um, since I seconded the first, I'll second the, the second. Yeah. It's kind of, what Steve, <laughs> kind of what Steve meant to say. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. If I hadn't Thank cut him you. off. Thank you. <laughs> any any uh, questions on the amendment? Uh, we have a, a, an amendment motion in, in front of us. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And I believe we have to vote on the full motion after the amendment. So uh, we have a motion and, and a second with respect to this motion now that it's been corrected. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Second, I mean uh, oppose rather, <laughs> amendment. I'll be all right. It's almost nine, it's past my bedtime. Uh, any abstentions? Motion passes, thank you. Uh, we have ordinances for introduction. Jeff? Uh, we, have we have the Hold on. The resolution concerning applications to the State of Connecticut Department of Emergency Management and Homeland Security uh, from Mike Turner, Director of Emergency Management. Uh, for next time, also a resolution supporting CROG's uh, grant applications for a regional data disaster recovery center and human resources online clearinghouse and templates. So those will be on for next agenda. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, we have approval of the minutes, uh, item six, town council meeting March 3rd. Do I have a motion? Motion so approved. Thank you. And a second? Second. 
Thank you, Donna. Any uh, changes, amendments, corrections? I have a bunch of uh, typos that I'll give to Doris afterwards, all minor changes. Very good. Um, Paul, this is probably in Jerry's list, but I, um, on page three, I think Standish House it should, was misspelled. Very good. Mike Doris will make those corrections, I'm sure. Any other additions or changes? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? And I believe that is. We have uh, anyone wishing to speak from the public to finish the evening? Gus. What's new, right? Uh, good evening again, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. I just briefly looked at this Board of Approved Proposed Budget, and uh, the word frugal came to mind. Pretty good. And on previous occasion, you always, uh, well, I made more than always questions, is who represents the taxpayers and who represents the students? I never really liked the idea, but anyway, the budget for 2013 to 2014 was $53,000, uh, 53 million dollars. The proposed budget for 14, 15, it's 55. An amount of increase of basically $2 million. And I just looked it through quickly. And again, keep in mind that basically 82% of the budget goes to salaries and benefits. Uh, page four, under proposed budget salaries, plus $760,000. Uh, page five, I guess, the next page, where it says uh, benefits, 376. That comes to an amount of uh, 1.1 plus million dollars. And that doesn't really bother me until I found one of the last page, <laughs> page 12, and again, remember that I say, who looks after the students? Proposed budget, supplies and materials, that you have to assume that supplies and materials go toward probably the students and whatnot, uh, the, the teachers too, minus $165,000. What did I notice? Salaries and benefits went up $1.1 million, and supplies and materials went down. We're cutting where we're not supposed to. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Other comments from the public this evening? George. Good evening again, George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. It's been an interesting meeting. I'm sitting here sometimes saying to myself, some of it seems to be being done with smoke and mirrors, <laughs> but that's because I don't understand it. I'm just a simple folk. A couple of uh, other points, though. Uh, Dolores mentioned the American Warrior Project. I would certainly encourage that you will support that thing. Some of you know that I had the privilege and the honor of going to Washington with that program. I believe it was back in 2012. It happened to be, at that time, on Memorial Day, which is a very special day to this particular event. And I would certainly encourage that you advertise this and try to get people to attend. It would be very, very rewarding. I mentioned that it happened on Memorial Day for a very particular purpose. Because this past week, I received from the town, as the head of the Wethersfield Taxpayers Association, an offer to march in the Memorial Day Parade, which I will be declining. What disturbed me, there was in that letter, there was not a single solitary word, not a single solitary word, that talked about the real meaning of Memorial Day that it's to memorialize those young men who got killed in a war, gave their lives to their country. 
It talked about veterans. You know, I'm one, so what? It talked about making sure that the public speaking announcer could tell all about whoever's marching by, where the fire engine was made in the fire truck. I just kind of was appalled. And I share that with you. Thoughts from the heart. I really, somewhere along the line, we've got to stop and take stock of what it is we're doing on Memorial Day. You all got my cartoon that I sent some time back about the, the veteran putting some flowers on the tomb of a soldier. And it was to remind America, it's, it's not a barbecue weekend. And personally, for our town officials, our town to be involved with this, I find kind of disheartening. Enough said on that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the other thing that uh, I had a chuckle with Jerry Roberts' descriptions of the potholes on Fox Hill Road, it is, it's between, <laughs> between Maple Street and Two Brook. And, and I get down that street all the time on the left side. You know, I'm practicing like I'm driving in England. I mean, that's pretty bad. <laughs> But I just shared, I had a chuckle, I'm not, I'm no serious complaint, I know Jeff's got his problems on, on, on fixing that. The, but an, another thought I, I, has been on my mind for some time, and uh, it has to do with the Chamber, the Chamber of Commerce. And when the Chamber initially came up with the idea of having this fireworks on Memorial Day, you know, we're gonna have a party on Memorial Day, like I said, sometimes someone told me let's have a happy Memorial Day. Uh, they backed off at that particular point. But what concerned me is if the chamber moved it and wants to do it and wants to pay for it, be my guest. But I really don't think that we, the town, should be subsidizing a business activity that the chamber is undertaking. I really don't think so. What came to my mind is that the $15,000 in and of itself is not a tremendous amount of money. I, I can understand that. I, I'm not saying, oh, we're going to go bankrupt. But as I have stood before this council forever almost, trying to get our town, all of our town, to fix that blighted spot right next door to me, all I ever hear is, we ain't got $80,000. The $80,000 always sound as though my net assets were $100,000 and I'm asking you to spend 80000 of it. My God, it's a disaster. And, and I personally, I personally think, it is, I think it's almost as an affront, not to me personally, but to the, to the citizens of the community right in that area there. To, uh, I, I just don't think we should do that. And along the chamber comment, I had noticed on the town calendar that on the first Thursday of every month, on the public on the calendar meetings, is a chamber meeting. And I'm saying to myself, I, I never picked up on it. I don't look at the calendar that carefully. And I said to myself, what is this meeting about? The Chamber of Commerce gets its name in the, in the paper quite often, the Wall Street Journal, as a big powerful lobbying group in Washington. Now the chamber is the chamber is the chamber. Now granted, some of the chapters are a little different than others. But it's a lobbying group. And correct me if I'm wrong. And I find, I say to myself, why would a lobbying group be listed on the town calendar as having a regular meeting, which I have to feel, I have to suspect, is taking place with town officials. What's transpiring there? And I, I have to presume it's an open meeting. Is that a reasonable presumption? Come on, you can't be as quiet. The board acts like this all the time. <laughs> is it or isn't it? It's just yes or no. I don't know. Is it open to the public? Okay. It is. All right, that's all I want to know. That's, that's fine, because I thought about coming, and, and, and I'm not afraid of being, trying to be thrown out. <laughs> that doesn't particularly scare me. But I personally would, under, under the circumstances, to take 20%, and the $15,000 is about 20% of the $18,000, $80,000 to fix that pond, and to spend it on fireworks, while the citizens in that section of town have to live with that blight on and on and have lived with it for years. It just doesn't seem like a very good idea. And I would certainly not encourage that you do that. If the chamber wants to do it, for business purposes, be my guest. And, well, the reasons for it are, let them pay the whole thing, that's the way I feel about it. So other than that, I, uh, 
Tell you what, just a couple of the thoughts. I, uh, I've got your coffee date written down. <laughs> I'm going to try to make the next one. <laughs> Should be interesting chatting. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have yourselves a uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, and uh, we'll see you. Thank you, George. Any other comments? Thought? Oh, Stacy? Speak up. I can't hear most of you. Just moment. Good evening, Mayor Montaneri and Deputy Mayor Barry and Councilors. It's a pleasure to be in front of you this evening. It's exciting. The Chamber is really excited about the funds that we're going to raise and that we're sort of fronting for the fundraisers. I wanted to give you the opportunity to meet our fundraisers, Joan Ivana Marrero. They've been working very diligently and hard raising uh, funds so that our town could have fireworks. Um, and I mean they've been working really, really hard. So we really appreciate all the work. Joe originally spoke to me because he wanted to raise funds for a gazebo. <laughs> and I said, a gazebo? How about fireworks? And so he's been working ever since uh, with me in the chamber and our uh, chamber uh, executive uh, secretary to do that. I do want Mr. Roon to know that the chamber is a open meeting. We would be glad to have you there. We don't lobby for anything at all. Uh, the fireworks is really to benefit the town, um, to bring people and businesses to view old Weathersfield, spend money, maybe have dinner, do some other things to attract them uh, to the town of Weathersfield. And we thought it would be a great thing for the community, for them to all get together. All I've been hearing is people remembering when and what they did when fireworks was in Mill Woods. And those are some special memories and we've gotten many phone calls uh, to that effect. Um, so we're doing a lot of fundraisers. I just wanted to plug what we're doing in the month of April. On April 8th, we're doing the Rockettes with, uh, as a business after hours. On April 11th, we, we're doing a dinner at the Yacht Club. On April 12th, we're having a car show at, I think it's DOT, D, no, Department of Labor. Um, a car show. So that's everything that's happening in April, and we have a bunch of upcoming events thereafter. So um, keep uh, your ear out. And that's all I wanted to say. Did you want to say anything else? So thank you so much for your time. Thank Appreciate you, Stacy. Thanks for your efforts, too. Other public comments? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Must be. <laughs>